Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In order to look forwards, sometimes we have to reflect on and learn from our past. And certainly in our shared history, there is much to learn from. In the mid 13th century, for example, with the chilling words, none of that people should be spared, not even the babe in its cradle. The Mongol warlord Genghis Khan had declared his intention to destroy one of the most intellectually and politically significant Muslim communities of the time, the Ismailis. In 1256, with the fall of Alamut in modern-day Iran at the hands of the Mongols, the massacres that followed convinced observers that this powerful voice of Shia Islam had been silenced forever. Yet still, in the centuries of concealment that followed, how is it that the Ismailis continued to survive? How did the flame of the faith continue to burn for generations to come? In Central Asia, Generations of Murids faced waves of persecution. Colonial expansion by rival powers in the mid-19th century further contributed to the fragmentation of the region isolating the Ismailis of Central Asia. Under Soviet rule, Murids had to practice their faith in utmost secrecy. And prior to Hazar Imam's visit to Tajik Badakhshan in 1995. The Jamaat of the region had not seen their Imam for centuries. In 1923, when Imam Sultan Muhammad Shah alayhi salam, sent Pir Sabza Ali on a very long and strenuous journey to Central Asia to establish contact with the isolated Ismaili communities of the mountainous regions and to convey to them the Talika of the Imam. Bir Sabzali recalled how the Jamaat welcomed him as if they were welcoming the Imam himself, for he had been blessed with the Didar of the Imam. He spoke of how, as the Talika was being read out, Murids had tears in their eyes, with many yearning to hold a copy of the Talika and to kiss it when they got the chance. They were remembering how their forefathers had yearned their entire lives to hear these words of blessings from the Imam. And that they lived in hope throughout their lives that one day, if not then, then at least their future generations would have that opportunity. How is it that these Murids lived with so much hope? Where did they draw their strength from? In Syria, the difficult and divisive political climate of the late 8th and 9th centuries caused our early Ismaili Imams fearing persecution to remain anonymous. Yet still, in the centuries of fragmentation that followed, how did the Jamaat maintain its identity? More recently, the political and social turmoil caused by the 1947 partition in the Indian subcontinent, the expulsion of Asians from Uganda that led to the eventual migration of Murids to the West, the civil wars of Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Syria, and most recently, the refugee crisis of recent years, are just more examples of how regional catastrophes have had a global impact, affecting the lives of many, including Ismailis. And so what is common to all these lived experiences? Where Ismailis have either been directly persecuted or where they have been affected by their political, social, economic or natural environments. The common thread here is the resilience of the Jamaat. The ability of the Jamaat to not only overcome their challenges,
but to thrive on the other side as well. And this resilience came from their faith, from the unshakable conviction that their Imam was by their side, holding their hand, protecting them, showing them the light and carrying them through their darkest nights. It was this conviction that allowed them to live with hope and to rebuild their lives with a deep sense of inner happiness. In a speech made at an institutional dinner in New York in 1986, Malana Hazar Imam said, and I quote, I think it would be foolish to believe that there are no problems. Life is made of problems. They occur every day to just about everyone around the world. And I think that it is important that we should simply accept that that is life and we must live it fully and courageously." Unquote. Apra jeevan ma takleef aave chhe, par apre himmat thi barpoor jeevo joye. But how does one live fully and courageously, particularly in the face of trials and tribulations? You know, some would say that we live in a world full of danger, both perceived and real. And this ever-present threat can often hinder us from being happy. We may be afraid of natural disasters or crime or illness. We may worry about personal failure or embarrassment. We may have suffered a trauma or experienced a loss. Whatever the situation, it can distance us from being happy unless we are able to overcome it. And one of the ways in which we can overcome it, as our Imam reminds us, is by living fully and courageously. You know, research in the field of positive psychology is currently exploring the idea of how certain practices can enhance our well-being, ultimately enabling us to live fully and courageously. What is interesting, however, is that these practices are also principles of our faith, principles of our tariqah, and therefore another example of how science endorses the idea that living our faith can allow us to build resilience and hope as we look towards the future, as we navigate fully and courageously through life's difficulties and challenges. So what are these practices of well-being, these principles of our tariqa? The first is the practice of gratitude. See, there's an old saying that if you have forgotten the language of gratitude, you will never be on speaking terms with happiness. The second practice is the practice of generosity, helping one another, supporting each other, to be the best that we can. According to a study conducted by the International Journal of Behavioral Medicine in 2005, it was found that helping others was proven to boost physical happiness. The research further uncovered that volunteering increased feelings of self-competence, was known to improve an individual's mood and also reduce stress levels. And these findings were also reported in the World Happiness Report, published only last year in 2019. The next practice is the practice of positivity. You see, there are many ways in which we can look at our world, but it's the perspectives, the lenses with which we choose to see our world that makes all the difference. The next practice is that of forgiveness, of letting go. You see, forgiveness includes emptying ourselves of any anger, any animosity, any negative feelings. And when we do so, we create a positive energy that allows us to fill that empty space with compassion, kindness, and other such qualities. And therefore studies show that forgiveness has a direct correlation with physical health. And the fifth practice 
is that of mindfulness. The practice of being aware of one's own reality, one's true purpose. But how are these practices relevant to me today? If these practices are a way in which I can live my faith, how do I live my faith in these current circumstances? With a lockdown due to the coronavirus pandemic, with a total lack of physical interactions, with the temporary closure of Jamaat Khanas, how do I reconcile my faith? How do I draw strength and resilience from it just like my ancestors did. You see, when a pandemic like this interrupts our daily routine, it forces us to stop. And it presents us with an opportunity to reflect. To reflect at a personal level, both outwardly, but also inwardly. At a family level at a community level, at a human level, and at a spiritual level. And this notion of reflection itself is an act of faith. You know, many of us who are self-isolating will perhaps now be spending more time than before with our families, with our children whilst at home. And this presents us with an opportunity to of course build on those bonds. But there may also be those who are now forced to live in isolation with strained relations. And so how do we practice positivity in such situations? How do we forgive past transgressions and initiate that process of self-healing? Perhaps even extending a hand of warmth if that is what is required to build on the relations that have strained over the years. It's not easy. No one said it would be. But our faith does encourage us to try and find ways. In addition, there will be members of the Jamaat who are living in complete isolation by themselves whose normal interaction would have been through work or through social activities or through Jamaat Khana. And you see, our institutions, our Jamaati Mukhi Kamriyas, Mukhyani Kamriyanis, and our various boards and committees are working very hard to maintain those connections, particularly with the most vulnerable in our Jamaat. But each one of us has a role to play. Firstly, in being the good citizens that we can be, in following the guidance of our governments. But in addition to that, each one of us has the ability to call in on someone, to check that they are okay, albeit with a simple phone call or a text message. Each one of us has the ability to be thoughtful in our actions. For example, in the way in which we engage in our essential grocery shopping, perhaps this global situation, like never before in our lifetimes, really shows how interconnected humanity really is. How none of us can truly be free until we are all free. And this presents us with an opportunity to reflect on our interdependence, but also on our dependence on Allah and therefore it is the power of prayer of ibadat particularly during times of difficulty that can bring us peace comfort and happiness you see when we pray we allow our personal egos to step aside and we surrender ourselves over to a higher power asking it to work through us to bring about a sense of balance and healing. I hope that today we have been able to explore how throughout history faith has played such an integral role in the lives of Ismailis and how faith continues to remain a great source of strength, hope and resilience as we look towards the future. The faith of our ancestors teaches us that there is 
great power in prayer. There is immense healing in prayer. Prayer strengthens Iman, faith. Faith that can be a source of hope and resilience, particularly during these uncertain times.
There are days where I wonder, wonder If there was no one to do what you do I'd hold up the corners of a smile And better a life Imagine what could change if we all do the same
Thank you. I have your favorite masala chai ready for you. Take care, be happy, and ya Ali Madad. Thank you.